Amen, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus one more big hand clap of praise. Listen, well, honor today. We are blessed as a church to have Brother Ken Freeman uh, with us. You know, it was, man, y'all remember VHS? How many of you actually remember a VHS tape? All right, tell our age here. My dad gave me a VHS tape years ago, brother, of your testimony. And so I heard that a long time ago. I was like, wow, that's an amazing testimony. And then he's been to our community several times and uh, preached at SummerSlam and and uh, just been such a blessing to our community. And um, when I heard he was going to be in the area, um, he's from Texas, but when I heard he was going to be in the area, uh, I invited him to come. He graciously uh, said yes, and so we're honored to have you, brother. You're married to Debbie, two sons, yeah, I'll, I'll eight grandkids. Yeah. All right, come on. I'll do All it. All right, come on. Stand to your feet. Give a big CT welcome. Thank you, dude. You, All right. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm not used to people clapping. Uh, I, I can tell, you know, I know this, you're a non-denominational church, but you are definitely a free non-denominational church. And uh, that's a whole lot better than being in bond. How many of you, you've never heard me speak before? Raise your hand. You've never heard me and you want to give me money. God, those hands go down quick. How many of y'all have heard me before? Raise your hand. You want to give me more money than, okay, this, I'm going to leave rich. Um, I got to work kind of fast. Um, I was, I had two messages on my heart and uh, I've been doing this for 38 years. Um, until the pandemic, I was traveling 280, 300 days out of the year. And, um, and it's been a great journey. Uh, but when the pandemic hit uh, for six months, what was taken away from me was being able to travel and preach and see people saved. I've done 20,000 school assemblies. In fact, I've been in your schools here. And uh, I'll be back in August. It's called The Great Comeback. It's going to be in Eddyville, wherever that is. Um, I'm going to be there. Um, but it's going to be a week-long comeback deal. And, uh, and so for five months, I had no income. My wife... Um, was, and, and I got COVID in July. Hallelujah. It was so awesome. Um, I love it when I say I got COVID. Everybody's going, oh, good. Let's, and um, anyway, my wife didn't get it. I prayed for that because it could have been bad. Um, I don't know how I got it, but she's never gotten it. I got it. I got knocked down for about 14 days. Um, I just preached the week before. I got to preach for 16 times in six days. And then I got COVID. So it was a great, great uh, experience in my life. Uh, but I beat the COVID. And uh, so there you go. And uh, so, there, so anyway, it's been a long journey, but I'm kind of trying to get back on the road. I haven't had a lot of events. Uh, starting in July, I will. Uh, again, I've been doing this 38 years, 280, 300 days out of the year. And uh, that got taken away from me for about five or six months. So I got on social media. And almost every day I preach something on social media. I did it on Facebook and just different places. Uh, I did some Zoom meetings and administered to some other people. So I just did my best to, to stay focused and not live in fear. Um, I got my, my wife and I both got our shots. I, I, don't, I only got them because uh, I'm on the board of a ministry in Africa and I want to go overseas again. And so that's probably the only reason I got it. Uh, but we got to quit living in fear. Um, you know, and by the way, we've been wearing masks way before COVID. Mask of criticism, complacency, religion. We've been wearing all kinds of masks. And, uh, the div and, and, so, and so bottom line is this. Um, he has uh, turned, he set us free. We're working through all this. And I challenge you, by the way, as he was reading in uh, Psalms 119, Turn there real quickly. I'm not going to preach from it, but in, in fact, you've already had one message, so let me give you a second one. No, it's a great word. I know it's a great word that he gave out of several, but he went to Psalms 119, and I want you to look. By the way, Psalms 119, anybody know how many verses are in there without looking? All of them. <laughs> All of them. 176 verses are in Psalms 119. Are you ready for this? 159 times. In Psalms 119, 159 times, 
the word of God is referred to 159 times. Now, I notice some of you without Bibles. I'm going to go ahead and go here, okay? I'm so happy for your phone. I got my phone too. But you know what? You can't pass your phone on to your kids, but you can pass your Bibles on to your kids. Pastor, this is my 11th preaching Bible. I have 10 grandkids, married 49 years this year, two boys, 10 grandkids, and um, I'm, I have, I've going to give, I've already signed them and filled them out. My 10 grandkids are getting my Bibles, 10 Bibles that I've preached through through the years. This is my last preaching Bible that I will give to my son, who is a pastor. I get to see him tomorrow in Nashville. He's a pastor in Oklahoma City, and I will give him my last Bible. I would encourage you right now from this day on, get you a paper copy of the Scripture. Get you a paper copy, get you a notebook, carry that with you, and begin to write stuff down. Now, for you that don't have a Bible, I'm assuming you got the thing memorized. <laughs> so if I get stuck, I'm calling on you. Can I get an amen? amen. We're going to have fun here in a few minutes. Psalms 119, would you look at verse 57? He kind of went there, if I'm not mistaken. It said, Lord, you are mine. Now, I'm reading from the New Living. Pastor, I don't know what version you use, but I use a New Living. I just like how it reads. My son uses the ESV, which is probably the best, but let me read from here. It says, Lord, you are mine. I promise to obey your words. Notice that word commandment, um, uh, statute, and rules. And Anyway, just look at it. He said, I promise to obey your words. With all my heart, I want your blessings. Be merciful as you promised. So I kept reading. I pondered verse 59. I pondered uh, Psalms 119, 59. Um, I pondered the direction of my life, and I turned to follow your laws. Verse 60. I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Notice this, but look at verse 61. Evil people try to, try to drag me into sin, but I am firmly anchored in your instructions and your word. Listen, if you get into the word, the word of God's going to get into you. Yes. Guys, this has got to be, this is a marriage manual. This is, it's a Sunday school book. It's anything that you need. Uh, how to date, how to live, how to love, how to serve. It's right here. Amen? Yes. Now, I'm going to give you a word in just a moment, but I'll give you a little bit of my life, and I'm giving you a short version. Out in the foyer, <laughs> I bought. A, I have two books that I've written my stories in both of those books. I've got another cassette out there, or, or a CD out there, I'm sorry. A CD, it says Grace Works. You ought to get it because grace is the key. Now, I'm not going to preach on that today. I'm going to go a different direction just because many of you have not heard my story. Revelation 12, 11 says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Now, you're looking at a dude. I should be a wife beater. I should be a child abuser. I should be a drug user, and I should be an alcoholic. But by the grace of God, over 51 years ago, living on a couch, a family let me live on their couch. They took me in. A guy got me to go to church, and I ain't ever going to be the same. Now, I don't know when you're supposed to get over this. I, I just turned 69 in March. Thank you for the compliment. I'm on Social Security, I'm on Medicare, and, but the day I wear my pants to here with white socks and sandals, I told my wife to shoot me. <laughs> Age shouldn't be a gauge for serving God. It's all about your heart. Amen? So, I, listen, I'm, I'm, I've been in a lot of churches. I can tell this church got a great Great favor of the Lord is on this church. I can sense it in your worship. Just in, I mean, you're actually smiling. You're actually, it looks like you're happy, loving each other. I mean, our country could learn maybe from this church. If you're listening, say yes. yes. Bottom line is nine stepfathers in my life. I was in jail at 15. I was suicidal at 10 after one of my dads beat me one night that I remember. Cleaned the blood off the back of my legs, took a bottle of aspirins. Um, and, and I don't think anybody wants to die. I think they want the pain to stop. So I'm in jail at 15, suicidal at 10, first drink of alcohol at 9. My mom's an alcoholic. My dad was a gutless man, knew how to make a baby, didn't want to be a daddy to a baby. Everybody say, God. God. 
Everybody say, and the, and the devil. Have a plan. Man, this is something I'd be writing down. By the way, I get to go to my church because I've not had a lot of meetings. And so I've been going to my church. And listen, I've, I can't write fast enough. We have four services, one on Saturday night, three on Sunday. Pastor, I'll usually go on Saturday night. And then I'll go again on Sunday because I can't get enough what I got on Saturday. Some of y'all might want to come back for the second service. We'll sit you on the floor. But here's the bottom line. Everybody say God. And the devil have a plan, a purpose, and a blueprint for my life. You know, they say there are two things for sure, death and taxes. That's not true. There are three things that are for sure, death, taxes, and eternity. You better make sure that you know that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everybody say God and the devil have a plan, a purpose, a blueprint for my life. Now, I want you to know, my dad walked out of my life. I was four. My sister was two. My dad knew how to make a baby, didn't want to be a daddy to a baby. 38 million kids in America have no idea where their real father is. 19 million kids in America, that's 50%, have never seen their real dad. You see, you're looking at a dude, if anybody ought to be flipping God off or hating God, if anybody here ought to be atheist or agnostic, it ought to be me. But God had a, and a, and a, man, I'd write those three things down every day. There's not a pandemic that can change his plan, change his purpose or his blueprint for your life. But we've got to consciously every day make a choice. You notice what your student pastor, he used the word a lot. Guys, we got to base everything we do on this Bible. We got to get back to the book. And I would encourage you with everything that I can, get a copy of the scripture. Start underlining. I mean, I, I just started underlining stuff that he was reading. It was powerful. My mom was an alcoholic. I've slept in bars, streets, cars. I love your church, by the way. <laughs> what the enemy meant for bad, but God meant for good. We just getting drunk in a different way. Can I get an amen? amen? And so bottom line is this. I grew up, I lived in bars, streets, cars, alleys, backyards, garages, abused every way that you could be abused. My mom uh, one night held a knife to my throat at 10. My sister was eight. Um, I, I thought I was having a bad dream, and I woke up with her whiskey breath in my face, a knife at my throat. My sister, she's drug into the room. My mom threatened to kill us all the time, telling us we came from hell. We cost her too much money. We'd be better off dead. And, oh, by the way, in my story, there were churches all around us. But nobody knocking on our door. You see, what you guys did on Friday, and I wish I could have been there, that was me. You see, bottom line, when I was growing up, we didn't know color. We just knew survival. You see, it's not, and by the way, it's not about race, it's about grace. It's not about skin, it's about sin. We just got it all messed up. Bottom line is, I'm just telling you, I'm begging my mom not to kill us. She eventually drops the knife in the ground, passed on my chest. We got to live another day. Two years later, at the age of 12, I had a chance to cut my mom's throat. She's passed out in the kitchen floor. I rolled her over, ran that blade across her throat, thinking if I could kill her, I could stab her, I could, that I would save me and my sister. But God had a, and a, and a, for our life. Now, I'm going to read some familiar passages. You just got to make sure you're on the right plan. You got to make sure you're on the right purpose. I mean, I love what you, I mean, this is the biggest screen I've seen in my life. I mean, if you're having trouble seeing that, you, you need to get some glasses. But it's, I mean, I love the feel of this church. But see, there are greater days ahead. Instead of having two services, you might need a Saturday night service as well. I mean, let me tell you, you may be, and I've been in Princeton bunches of times, but I don't know why, why I haven't been here yet because this is an incredible place. You're blessed. So 
I'm not just saying that to say it. I'm just saying you're blessed. Bottom line is, any way you could be abused, I was abused. Uh, I had a chance to kill my mom. I didn't drop the knife in the ground. Me and my sister cried ourselves to sleep. By the time I was 10, my sister was 8. We got smart, can you imagine? And we slept in our school clothes at night. By the way, I went to 24 different schools growing up. Five different high schools my last year of school. Nine stepfathers. I want you to understand any way you could be abused. And so when time I'm 10, my sister 8, we slept in our school clothes at night. And that way, not every night from the age of 10 to 15, I slept on a floor next to my baby sister's bed. That way, when my mom drove up, if I heard her, work, she worked at bars and clubs, she would come in so she wouldn't beat us up. I'd wake my sister up. We'd slip out the back door, depending upon where we lived. We would hide in a backyard, a garage, a street, an alley. A couple of hours later, we could go back in. Can you imagine this? And we'd get a good night's rest. And there were churches all around us. Nobody knocking on our door. Guys, we can't get happy. See, can I tell you the saddest side in this auditorium? Anybody want to guess? Empty seats. It's amazing. We can get off the couch and go to Walmart, but we can't get off the couch and go to church. See, I get to say stuff that he'd like to say. Because I don't give a rib. See, I, I just wouldn't be a good pastor because I'd slap somebody. I wouldn't vote on it, pray about it. I'd just kick them. And I feel bad for you because they say stuff like, one of these days I'm leaving, and I'm thinking, if I was pastor, I would say, my prayers have been answered, go. My favorite one is, I was here before you, and my answer to that would be, and when the rapture comes, you're still going to be here. Can I get an Amen. We're going to have fun. <laughs> Bottom line is, I want you to understand, any way that we could be abused, we were abused. My mom left us for a three-day drunk. I woke up. She said, I'll see you in three days. She left us with an ex-boyfriend. I wake up 30 minutes later, at, at least that's what I think, to my baby sister crying. I, my anger turned to fear. First, I'm angry. This dude's doing horrible things to my sister. He grabs me by the arm, and, and then it's my turn. And there were churches all around us. There are Ken Freemans right here in your community. Do you understand that 70 to 80% of students in your schools come from divorced and broken homes? Guys, we, listen, God has a and a and a for your life. Now, I want you to understand that uh, I ended up moving to Texas. I was born in Virginia. Just got to Texas as quickly as I could. After I got saved, this guy got me to go to church and I gave my life to Christ. Another family took me in in San Antonio, Texas. I got to live in a camper shoved up in their carport. I thought it was a condo. I've always had a job. I finished high school. I got two years of college. I've written three books. I have two of my books here. Married 49 years this August 17th, two boys, 10 grandkids, and a dog named Peaches. <laughs> My boys think that I love Peaches more than them, and I do. <laughs> she wants a biscuit. They want, my, they want my money. She wants a biscuit. She poops in my backyard. They pooped on my life. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? See, you're looking at somebody that should be a wife beater, child abuser, drug user, and an alcoholic. But God had a, and God had a, and God has a for your life. If you're listening, say yes. I will, and I'm giving you the short version. The long version's in my books. And I'm not gonna get rich if you buy one. I just bought a few, brought a few with me. But if you buy one, I just go to Walmart a little more than you. And by the way, can I say this? You're in the best location you can be. Anytime you can be across the street from a Walmart, look at the publicity your church gets every single day. So you got to give them a reason to want to be here. Amen? I will tell you that uh, I was able to forgive my mom. I'd been saved uh, just uh, in February 7th, 1970. I'd been saved a few years, three or four years. And one night I came into my Jesus parents, that's what I call them, that took me in, I said, you know, um, why is it when I see families, I want to put my fist through a wall, I want to cuss, or 
And Malcolm looked at me and my Jesus dad, and he said, do you love your mom and dad? And I said, if I had a gun, I'd, I'd blow their brains out. I hate them. And he always took me to Scripture. Colossians 3.12, 3.13 says that we forgive others because he forgave us. February 7th, I called my, my mom. She answered the phone. She was a little drunk, not wasted. I began to tell her that I was a Christian. In fact, I lived with her for a few months as a Christian, just not a very good one. And, uh, and that's going to make sense when I get to Scripture in just a moment. I'll just go ahead and tell you, I asked her to forgive me, and she blubbered and cried, and she said, shouldn't, I, shouldn't you ask me? To? And I said, Mom, I've already forgiven you. I said, man, you're not my enemy. And so my mom did, and for 14 years, I, I witnessed to my mom. I loved my mom. My mom died at the age of 52. Uh, eyes oozed blood, skin turned yellow, body bloated. And I don't believe my mom ever got saved. She died lost. I called my dad that night. I found out where he was. I hadn't seen him in 16 years since I was four. The operator answered. She wouldn't put me through. Finally, I convinced her God would hurt her. She didn't put me through, and <laughs> she put me through. My dad answered the phone. I said, I'm looking for James uh, Freeman. He said, you got him. I said, my name's Ken Freeman, He's, and I'm his firstborn. And he said, what do you want? I said, I would love for you to be my dad. I said, I would love to meet you again. And I said, I want you to know that I'm a Christian. Would you forgive me for hating you? And he hung up on me. But I was free. By the way, my last name is Freeman. You don't think God had a plan? I mean, I could have been a Jones or a Smith. For, for, for all. I'm not making fun, but just saying he, he gave me the right name. Bottom line is I was able, uh, my dad hung up on me, sent me a horrible letter. 28 years later, I found out where he was. I flew to where he was. I shared my story with him. I think he wanted me to slug him. I mean, it's amazing as I walked in that front door and put my arms around him. I know he wanted me to do something. And I said, hey, you're my dad. I said, I've forgiven you a long time ago. 28 years ago, you hung up on me. 42 years ago, you walked out on me. I've shared my story. It took me 10 hours to share my story with him. And then for the next six years, I began to witness to him. And, on, and I'm giving you the short version. June 1st, 2004, I led my 78-year-old dad to the Lord. Amen. Pretty incredible deal. So I share that. Go, if you would, to Psalms 139. Go quickly. Go to Psalms 139. I'm going to look at three passages. I'm going to do my best to finish on time. Go to Psalms 139. When you get there, Sam, there. You ought to read Psalms 139, Pastor, is probably one of my favorite psalms. I would encourage you, if you're here, read it once a week. Read it once a week. I'm going to start reading Proverbs again. There's 31 Proverbs. I would encourage you, read a Proverbs every day, every day, seeking wisdom. My pastor does the same thing, and he's kind of challenged us, so I'm going to go back and do that again. Be in the Word. Go to Psalms 139, and would you look? Everybody say, God. And the, and the devil have a plan, have a, plan. a purpose, purpose, a blueprint, blueprint for my life. Look at Psalms 139, and if you would, look if you would at verse 14. Now, again, mine's going to read a little different. It says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. Look at verse 15. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. I, and I didn't, and I, I don't know if I gave these guys these verses or not, but thank you for putting those up. Keep reading. Look at what it says. Verse 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Even, listen, even in your mother's womb, and it's sad in America today that killing a baby is okay. Now, I don't know what you believe about that, but I'm just going to tell you it's wrong. Oh, what I didn't tell you is this. I got my first tattoo. <laughs> some of y'all like this, and some of y'all are going, I, I don't like you now, but I should have got a bracelet because it hurt. <laughs> but Trey's in the middle of this, and this year Trey would have been 15, but leukemia took his life. You would think I'd already been through enough. I mean, I'd rather, I'd have loved to have taken his place. I watched him. He died a pretty tough death. But let me tell you this, tell you this. Our loss is heaven's gain. He's with Jesus today. I'm just telling you right now. God saved him in an incredible, it's just powerful. 
He, my son went from five kids to four. Pastor, can you imagine this? And then he adopted two drug babies, Adele and Luke. They're going to find out something about their mom, Adele and Luke. Luke's white as white can be, got no hair. He just white. <laughs> then you got Adele. She's biracial. She's got a hunk of hair. We ain't got a clue what to do with it. <laughs> it's called a fro. Can I tell you, their half-brother and sister, my son, adopted both of those when they were just three or four days old. Are you ready for this? They're going to find out that their mom had eight kids with eight different men, and her trash became my grandkids. Listen to me. God has a and a and a for our life. You just got to stay on the course. Amen? So look at what he said in Psalms 139. Look at what he said in verse, um, verse 16. <clears throat> you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And look at verse 17. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. Go to Jeremiah 29. Now, everybody knows Jeremiah 29, 11. Yes? Some of you all do. Now, let me just say, you got to start memorizing Scripture. By the way, the other tattoo... Oh, Psalms 56.3 was Trey's favorite verse after he would throw up from chemotherapy. Seven years old, I want you to listen. And they would clean the vomit up and they would, they would quote this verse together, Psalms 56.3, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. And then Trey's oldest brother, Caleb, who I'm getting ready to see, he's gonna speak at the Southern Baptist uh, Conference with my son, I want you to understand that he was in a horrible car wreck. His brother walked away with bruised ribs and concussion. It just had hydroplane, ended up in the middle of the road. If you've not followed, in fact, he was here for, for a winter jam. Uh, Caleb was here. I want you to understand they gave him a 10% chance he'd live, 90% chance that he would never be of any value. My grandson, 16 years old, and I got this. There's always some but gods in our life. I wish I had four or five days with you, to be honest with you. Bottom line, there's always some but gods. Ephesians 2, 4, but God is rich in mercy and grace. Amen. There's always, what is it, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love while we were screwing up. He still sent his son to die for us. And I want you to know that Caleb, who was never supposed to walk, talk, eat, I want you to know, last year graduated from high school, finished his first year of college. He's walking without a walker. He's, his speech is coming back. And I want you to listen. He's memorized the book of Philippians. Four chapters he quotes every single night. Now, I'm getting ready to throw some truth, not rocks, but there are some of you here that won't pick up the, this Bible for days on end. Listen to me. There are some of you, you're only going to pray when you need something. I like praying when I'm, I don't need anything. So I want you to listen to me. My grandson, who's not supposed to even be here, is proclaiming the gospel. And he, and he knows. He knows where he is mentally and physically. He goes to all kinds of therapy, and I want you to listen to me close. He knows, but here's what he's told people. If this is where God has me, if this is where he has me, I just want to see people get saved and come to Christ. Psalms 1, I mean, Jeremiah 29, look at verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, see, we stop there, Pastor. But look at our pandemic and think about these next verses. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. But look at verse 14. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your, I'll end the COVID. See, the greatest virus in our world is not COVID, it's sin. That's what we ought to be concerned about. And look at what he says. I will end your captivity and I will restore your fortunes. She sang about the nations a minute ago. I got to go here. Go back to Psalm 67. 
uh, in one of her songs, she was singing, go to Psalm 67 on the airplane yesterday. I'm reading through a book and he, and he alluded to this and I want to read it. Look at Psalm 67 because she, whatever song it was about all the nations, going to all the nations, look at Psalm 67 verse one. I didn't give this to them. May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, verse two. Your saving power among among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all nations praise you. Verse four, let the whole earth sing for joy because you govern the nation with justice. You guide your people of the whole world. Verse five, may the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all your nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest and God, our God, will richly bless us. Look at verse seven. Yes, God, we will bless us. Man, I love this screen. I mean, it's like God's just amplifying it. Yes, God, we will, God will bless us, and people all over the world will fear him. God and the devil have a and a and a. See, I like churches that participate. Now go to my key verse. Go, if you would, to John chapter 10. Go to John 10. We're going to center in on one verse, and I'm working really fast, I promise. John chapter 10. When you get there, go if you would to verse 10. Now, I got a whole bunch of messages in John 10. He talks about sheep. Sheep hear God. Sheep knows God. Sheep follow God. Sheep can do nothing without a shepherd. The shepherd knows your needs. The shepherd knows your nature. The shepherd knows your name. That's another whole sermon. He says, my sheep hear my voice, follow my voice, know my voice. They hear my voice. But look at John 10, 10. There are two truths here. Look, if you would, you talk about a plan, a purpose, and a blueprint. The thief's purpose, John 10, 10, is to steal, kill, and destroy. You see, that's a deceptive voice. Some of y'all heard that voice during the pandemic. What are we going to do? I mean, how are we going to pay our bills? And now we got people that don't even want to work. I mean, I was on unemployment, and I probably could still be on it right now, but I've chosen not to. But I want you to hear me. Now we've got people because we've, I'm just telling you how it is. We've got a government that wants us willing not to work. Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. See, I can say stuff you'd love to say. See, truth is not always, let me see if I can say it right. Truth is not always comfortable, but it's always right. And see, John 10, he says, the thief comes to steal. Every six minutes, there's a murder in America. Every eight minutes, there's a rape. Listen to this. Every 15 minutes, someone dies with somebody drinking and driving. Every 16 minutes, there's a suicide. Children under the age of five will be beaten to death by somebody they love. If you're listening, say, I am. Guys, I want you to listen. If you read Revelation 12, 12, the Bible says this. The devil knows that his days are are short. He's running out of time. You know what he would love to do with this church? Divide you. And a house divided against itself is gonna... You can't stand. So I want you to hear me close. You're looking at a dude should be a wife beater, child abuser, drug user, alcoholic, but 51 years ago living on a couch, a family let me live there for a while. A guy gets me to go to church. I got saved, and I'm never going to be the same. I'm in good shape for the shape I'm in. John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, kill and destroy. He's got a plan. He wants to end your marriage. He wants young people going to bed before marriage. He wants young people getting abortions. He wants young people doing drugs. He wants wants you to gamble. He wants you to get, he wants you to be addicted to something. We have Celebrate Recovery at our church. 
every Tuesday, and I'm usually there every Tuesday. I go because we're all, we're all going through recovery. Yes. See if I can say it right. Addiction, hang on. I just write quotes down all the time. See if I can find this one. Did I write it? Did I write it? Hang on. Addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Did you hear me? Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. If you're going to be addicted, you ought to be addicted to Jesus. Pastor, I probably just gave you a sermon title right there. And by the way, very rare that a pastor even takes notes. I'm constantly writing. I'm going to a deal tonight. I'm taking my notebook, my Bible. I want, I'm, listen, I'll write. I'm going to listen to my, my pastor online because I don't want to get behind. He's preaching out of Joshua. Incredible message, but I want you to hear me. God and the devil have a plan and a purpose and a blueprint for your life. And you get to choose right or wrong, good or bad, life or death. Look at John 10, the second part. See, that deceptive voice wants to rip you off. See, the greatest ripoff is religion. Hell's going to be full of religion and religious people. See, religion says do. Christianity, Christianity says it's done. We just enjoy what he's done and live in it. The greatest ripoff, everybody point to your head. Everybody say you can know about God. Point to your heart without knowing God. Hell will be full of people who missed heaven by 18 inches. My pastor called me up. Now, our church, we run around 17,000. Called me up, our last service, 1 o'clock service. Can you imagine this? We have over 3,000 come to our 1 o'clock service. You're a miniature version of ours. I mean, as excited as you are here, can you imagine 3,000? Some of y'all couldn't contain it. <laughs> he called me up. They'd sang a couple praise songs. I was, wearing my, I was wearing shorts and just wearing my butt God shirt and just sitting there with my wife. He said, hey, Pastor Kim, would you come up and pray? I said, all right, I'll pray. By the way, we're getting ready to baptize him. The last three weeks, Pastor, we've baptized over 530 people. We're seeing people come to Christ like crazy. And then when I finished praying, he says, now don't go. And I'm thinking, what, is, what, am, what am I doing now? He said, what I'd like for you to do. Now, people are standing everywhere. They're at the altar. They've been praying. He said, I want you to give an invitation. Now, nobody's even preached. So I gave an invitation. Over 200 people raised their hands to receive Christ that morning. Now, I want you to hear me. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I, want to, I don't know what you all believe, but the enemy can't take your salvation away. But he can steal your joy. David messed up pretty bad. Would you agree? Supposed to have been at war, got lazy, laid with somebody else's wife, got her pregnant, lusted the whole nine yards, killed her husband. The baby dies, marries her. And if you read Psalms 51, David didn't say, save me again. You know what he said? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. The enemy can steal that joy. He's, listen, can I tell you about the enemy? He can't defeat you. He's already defeated. But you better listen. Your openness to the enemy will defeat you. When you open to lies, when you open to lust, when you open to hate, when you open, when you open yourself to the enemy... You're in trouble. Keep the door closed. Look at John 10, 10, second verse. Jesus said, my purpose is to give you, is to give you, you know what that is? Everybody say salvation. He said, I've come to give you life. This, the thief's purpose still comes. My purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life, but I like the part that says, I've come to give you life. Everybody say salvation. That's where a lot of people stop. Some version says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Everybody say upgrade. upgrade. I never thought I'd say this, Pastor. There's more than just getting saved. Amen. 
my wife and I went on a trip to Maui for our 25th wedding anniversary and took our boys and and uh, I had enough miles to fly everybody and we 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 cut some deals and whatever and and so when I got on the plane I told the flight attendant I said ma'am this is my 25th wedding anniversary and I said would you announce that to I gave her my wife's name and said would you announce that to the whole plane I just would like to honor her so we're sitting there and we're we're back in the coat section and she said, oh, by the way, before we take off, um, Ken and Debbie Freeman are selling me. And my wife punched me. <laughs> she said, what did you do? And I said, hold on. Said, uh, they're celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. And everybody started clapping and cheering. And then she paused. And she said, but here's what Mr. and Ms. Freeman don't know. We have two first-class seats that are open. We want to upgrade them to first class. You see, he said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So here's my question today, and I got to close. I could go longer. You know that. <laughs> you don't even know me, but you know that. <laughs> Do you have real life? Don't answer out loud. Here's the question you got to answer. My grandson, can you imagine, Pastor, on the 11th floor, Dallas Children's Medical City Hospital, ask his mom this question, six years old. Mom, I'm going to die, right? Six years old. Because he knew on the 11th floor, Pastor, that you either went into remission, you got better, you died, or you got healed. She's going to make her way up and start playing. You can. I know you are. Look at me close. My daughter-in-law said, Trey, you know, God's not done with you yet. And here's what Trey said when he was six. But, Mom, you know I'm not a Christian, right? No, Trey, we're praying for you. Mom, I want to be a Christian today. And at the age of six, as best as a six-year knows, he asked Christ into his life. Pastor, you know how we know? Everybody that walked into his room, if you didn't know Trey, this was Trey's, hey, my name's Trey Freeman. I'm a born-again Christian. Jesus is the boss of my life. That's how he called it. <laughs> and he said, what about you? That was in January the 18th. 1-8 is a very important number for us. And on September 1st, Two thousand thirteen. I'm preaching at a church in San Antonio. We had about forty or fifty people saved that morning. My phone was right there. It's always, and I got the message. I didn't. My son had rushed to Dallas. Him and his wife and three oldest kids, and and uh, he was Trey was kind of going in and out, and they thought he was going to be okay, but. He texted me, he said, Dad, when you're, you're done, you, you need to call me. Trey's gone. I got my Jeep. I probably cried about 30 minutes. You want to be strong. So I called my son. I thought, you know, I'd probably get a voicemail. I'd just leave a message. But he answered. And I said, Jeremy, we don't have to talk now. He says, no, Dad, let's talk. And I said, can you give me the, the last hour? He said, well, Dad, we sang over him and we read scripture over him. About 45 minutes before Trey passed away, he went blind. He couldn't see. Well, by the way, we talked about seeing and hearing. You know what Helen Keller says? You know who Helen Keller was, right? She said, the worst thing that's being born blind is being able to see and have no vision. Listen to what Trey asked his mom about 45 minutes before he passed away. Mom, now I'm going to die, right? 
Listen to what she said. You see, God has a and a and a tray in about 15 minutes, you're not going to die. They were slowly turning the, the oxygen off, but train about 15 minutes, you're not going to die, but listen to what she said. But you're getting ready to really live. At my grandson's funeral, my son preached it. I gave an invitation. Over 80 people came to Christ. Oh, I've... If anybody needed to question God, I, I could have some questions. Or, it's just how you see. It's how you hear. It's what you know. So here's the question. Look at me close. If your heart were to stop, if you were to die, I'm not asking if you've been christened, sprinkled, dipped, dunked, or baptized. Those are great things. They just won't save you. I don't care if you, what church member you are. That, that's not going to save you. See, the question you've got to answer today, and I've got to go quick. If your heart were to stop, if you were to die, don't answer out loud. Do you know you'd spend eternity with Jesus Christ? Now, that's the question. 1 John 5, 13, these things are written that you might know you have everlasting life. Not hope. Not pray and not guess. It's the one thing you ought to know. And I promise you there's somebody sitting here today, you've never been saved. I promise you there's somebody here. And today is your day. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says today is the day of salvation. Now. It's a time. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Invitation won't be long. How many of you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you learned something today? Raise your hand. Hold up your hands. You learned something today. How many of y'all needed this message today for you? Raise your hand. It's giving you some hope. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask this question. How many sitting here, and I'm not asking if you're a member of this church. I'm not asking about your baptism. I'm not asking about your any of that. I'm not asking about your biblical knowledge. Here's my question. If your heart were to stop, if you were to die, how many sitting here would say, and I'm not, listen, I'm not asking about your commitment level or your convictions. I'm just asking about your relationship, you know that you're saved. That's all I'm asking. How many would say, Brother Ken, if my heart were to stop, if I were to die, if Christ were to come today, Brother Ken, I know that I know that I'm saved. I know that if I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Brother Ken, I know that. I've settled that. Put them down. Can I ask a second question? And I'm not going to come grab you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to call you out. I do want to pray for you. But is there anybody here that would say, Brother Ken, Mr. Freeman, yo, dude, this might surprise my husband, my wife. It might surprise my church. But Brother Ken, I'm going to be more real than I've ever been in my life. Because Brother Ken, if my heart were to stop, and I'm tired of being ripped off, Brother Ken. We can be ripped off with religion, with unbelief, fear, so, Brother Ken, I don't care what anybody in this room thinks right now, but if my heart were to stop, if I were to die, I honestly don't know that I've ever been saved. I honestly don't know that I'd go to heaven if I died, but I want to know, would you pray for me? With nobody looking but me, is there anybody here that would slip your hand up? Would you do that right now? You'd say, Brother Ken, I just don't know. I see one. I see two. Is there anybody else? I see three, four. Now, let me tell you why I'm going to ask it one more time. Some of you didn't raise your hand to either question. I need to tell you why. Maybe God's not dealing with you. And, Pastor, that's possible. 
maybe God's done dealing with you. I hope not. Or maybe you just don't need God. And see, you'll never know you need God till you need God. So I'm going to ask it again. How many, one more time, say, Brother Ken, Mr. Freeman, you'll do. This might surprise my family, my friends. But Brother Ken, I honestly don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I want to know, would you pray for me? Raise your hand one more time. Come on, put them up high. I want to see. One, two, three, four. I put them down. I see you. Now, you four or five that raise your hand, I want you to hear me. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you can believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's Lord and believe that he raised him dead, he said, I'll save you. Now, we're going to pray together, but let me say something about the prayer. This is not a get-out-of-hell prayer. It's not a magical potion. You see, the prayer is not saving you. The prayer is a confession of your heart. So if you'd like to be saved, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Now, you can whisper. You can softly speak it. You can shout it. You can move your lips. I don't care how you do it. But if today you'd like to be saved, you four or five, pray this with me. Come on. Grandma, mom, dad, just say, hey, Jesus, I'm tired of being ripped off. I'm tired of being on the wrong plan with the wrong purpose and the wrong blueprint. And so today, Jesus, if I'm the only one, I believe with all my heart that you died on the cross for my sins, took my place. I believe, Jesus, what you did, you did for me. Jesus, I didn't deserve it. Say it, I couldn't earn it or buy it. But Jesus, I believe what you did on the cross, you did for my sins and my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Now, Jesus, I want to tell you I'm sorry for my sin. You don't got to make a list because he knows your heart. I'm sorry for the garbage in my life, and I'm tired of being ripped off. And so, Jesus, today, I want to thank you for forgiving me and loving me. And And Jesus, right now, with all my heart, I want to repent. Here's what that means. Jesus, today, change my direction, how I walk, my mind, how I think, change my purpose how I live I receive you into my life and with my lips I want to call you Lord Savior Father Friend as my grandson Trey would put it I call you the boss of my life now with every head bowed every eye closed whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved only you and God knows if you meant business so I'm going to ask for you four or five that I could see. If that prayer was your heart and you prayed that with me just now and you meant that with all your heart, with nobody looking but me, would you slip your hand up? I just want to see. Hold on, I want to see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now put them down. Pastor is going to stand right here at the front, right here in front of me. I'm going to ask you seven to do one more thing. Right now, Brandon, their decision is private. We're, we're going to go public. Four times in the Gospels, at least four, Matthew 15, Mark 8, Luke 9, and John 12, four times Pastor Jesus says this, if you're not ashamed of me and my words, I won't be ashamed of you. In fact, he makes it more clear. If you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you to the Father. So here we go. Now the rubber's going to hit the road. I'm going to ask you to do two more things. You seven that said that said God saved you. As I count to three, I'm going to ask you to stand, remain standing with your head bowed. Now listen to me close. If you can't stand here with people that love you, you'll never stand anywhere. If you've got to look around to see who stands, I'd stay seated. You may be the only one standing. Are you ready? So as I count to three, if you believe that he saved you, there I could see seven. If you believe that he saved you today, I don't care who you are. I don't even care what you've done. Neither does God. But if you believe that he saved you, do me a favor. Don't wait for me to count to three. If you believe what you just did was real, stand up right now. Come on, stand up right now. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Unashamed. Unafraid, unashamed, unafraid, unashamed, unafraid.
Now, you that are seated, keep your eyes closed, head bent. You that are standing, look at me. If you truly believe that he saved you today, I want you to step out from your seat. Come stand right here in front of this pastor. Would you come join us right here? Just come stand right in front of him. You believe that he saved you today, just come stand right here. Unashamed, unafraid. Unashamed, unafraid. Unashamed, unafraid. Now I want you to look at me. You that are standing here, look at me. I'm going to start right here. I'm going to move over to here. If this is what you're saying, I want you to nod your head. Pastor, I don't even believe in a thing called rededication. There's no such thing. It's called repentance. You repent to be saved, and we repent to work out our salvation. That's that upgrade part. So I'm going to start right here. I'm going to come to here. And I want the pastor watching. If you're saying today, Brother Ken, God saved me, that's what you're saying. I want you to nod your head. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Can I say this to you? This is the greatest day of your life. Let me tell you what just happened. You just kicked the devil in his teeth. And you quit. You're no longer being ripped off. You now have been given life. And they got something, I think, whatever you call the, the next step or whatever, that's how you learn about the upgrade. Amen? Would you bow your heads? You that are seated, would you look up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And of the ten, one, two, three, four, five, it looks like six, six or seven are adults, not just teenagers. We just emptied hell started filling up heaven a little more. Now, I don't know how you do it here. Are you going to be able to speak with them, get a card filled out? What, what will you do? Okay, so at the end of the service, where are they going to meet you? At the end of this service, if you leave, one of your legs might break on the way out. <laughs> And I'm going to be at my table out here, but if, you, but if you would, I want you to meet with him so he can help you with this, this decision. Amen. You got Bibles maybe to give him. If you don't have a Bible, let him know. Church will get you a Bible. Would you clap for him one more time? Come on, church. Come on, church. Yeah? Let me ask. I know we're over, and I'm going to be out in the foyer for a few minutes, but let me ask you this. How many of y'all, there's somebody up here you've been praying for them? Raise your hand. Come stand with them. Come stand with them. Come stand with them. You've been praying for them. Come stand with them. Sir, how old are you? 70 years old. Just stepped out of hell into heaven. There you go. Got a brother right here. Hey, this is family. And let me just say this, church. Get sick and tired of empty seats. Start getting people here. Man, take them to breakfast before you go to church. Take them to lunch after. But listen, you've, there's a, an anointing and a favor here because you took a bar. His dad took a bar and I'm sure got some ridiculed from it. But look at the righteousness of God. Now I'm going to be in the foyer when I'm done. I don't have a whole lot of stuff out there. I've got, a, I've got a, about eight of them. It's called Grace Works. We just saw Grace Works. Yeah.